Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is wonderful to be with you again for this fifth Sunday after Easter, the fifth Sunday of Easter, of the Easter season. It is um, April 29th, and I guess I should say it's the it's the week. We'll be doing the, the lessons for the week of the fifth Sunday of Easter. It'll be a two-part episode. I'll do Acts and the Psalm in this first half hour, and then on Wednesday, if you tune in, then we'll be doing the um, epistle and the gospel reading for this Sunday. So thank you again for joining me. It is it's wonderful to be with you again. So we start, as we have been during the season of Easter, with a reading from Acts rather than a reading from the Old Testament. This week, that reading comes from uh, chapter 8 of the book of Acts, and it's verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch, the eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Philip, look, here is water, excuse me. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Again, that is our reading assigned for this week from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, and it's a little different than the Acts readings that we've had the past couple of weeks, right? That's Those have tended to be more... Um, uh, Peter, Peter speaking somewhere about the story of Jesus, but you can see that it's similar in tone, at least in terms of proclaiming the good news of Jesus and what that means, what Philip saw, what Philip knows, um, and all, all, all that, uh, the, the work that the apostles were assigned after Jesus departed after Jesus ascended. So we have this story. Um, it starts out with an angel of the Lord saying to Philip, you know, to get up and go to a certain place. It's a wilderness road, which makes it sound as though probably doesn't get a lot of traffic. Um, it's the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Um, or it could just mean that it goes to the wilderness. I mean, it's hard to say. <laughs> so he got up and went. I love these stories because they're so... They're so not loyal. They're so receptive. Um, many, not all, think of the Old Testament prophets. They they often weren't receptive to the instructions that they were given. But often in these biblical stories, um, God says or an angel says, go do this. And the person says, okay. 
And I think that we are so programmed to be skeptical in this day and age, so programmed to not take things at face value that if an angel were to say to us, go to this spot, our first question would be, why? Our second question might be, who are you? <laughs> or they could be interchangeable, right? Um, we might not believe that they are an angel. We, not, but we might not believe that it is God speaking to us. So the level of faith that is displayed in these stories always amazes me. And I, um, I, I often wonder how I might react if, you know, we talk all the time about the spirit speaking to us in various ways, and that might be through other people, and it might be through, you know, different ways, um, something occurring to us, something coming to us while we sleep. But I personally haven't had what I recognized as an angel, at least. Now, that could have been some of those people speaking to me, you know, the spirit speaking through them to me. But I, I haven't had... Um, a specific encounter that I can point to, at least, with an angel who says, Hey, Sarah, I want you to get up and I want you to drive to, I don't know, Arizona. <laughs> There's going to be a guy on this certain highway and just go. Okay, I would say, no, you're crazy. I'm not going to Arizona. I've got stuff to do. I've, I, you know, I've got a job. I've got a podcast. I've got... <laughs> dogs at home. I don't have time for this. But that's not the case with this story. So Philip gets up and he goes to that wilderness road. And there is um, another nameless person. We, we know that he's Ethiopian. We know that he is a court official of the Candace, which, who, which is the queen of Ethiopia. And we know that he's a eunuch. And then unfortunately, the poor guy just gets referred to as the eunuch through the rest of the story. He has no name. He is identified by what has been done to him, which not so great. But, yeah, I, I don't know my, what else really to say about that, but I, I do feel bad for this man. Of course, not he cares, having not been around for 2,000 years. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Sometimes I get a little frustrated with the lack of naming in the Bible. Anyway, not the point. Philip goes and he sees this man who happens to be reading from the scripture. He happens to be reading from the gospel or the, the, the prophet Isaiah. And he is reading that passage like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, which is often attributed to uh, Jesus. It's often seen as kind of a foreshadowing or a prophecy about Jesus going to the cross. And so he's reading that. And Philip, so Philip comes comes up alongside him and, and um, <laughs> he asks him what he's reading. This is another kind of funny thing. This isn't something that would necessarily happen if you were driving in your car. If somebody ran up alongside your car, looked in and said, hey, do you know what you're reading about? We would not invite them into our car, right? <laughs> It's a totally different day and age. That's all I'm getting at. Uh, fortunately, that's not what happens here. Philip runs over, says, hey, I see you're reading the prophet Isaiah. Do you know what it is that you're reading? And the guy says, well, how would I if I don't have anyone to teach me? I don't have anyone to guide me, which is very responsive, receptive of him to want to learn more about what he is reading. He he also doesn't ask about Philip's credentials. Well, how do I know that you can teach me about what I'm reading? Gosh, I'm just full of questions today, aren't I? I'm I've I, I've never really thought about this in terms of the details before, and just how how smoothly everything in this story goes. So he doesn't ask for his credentials. He he just trusts. That's I think that's what the story is about in a lot of ways. It's about trust. Tr Philip trusted the angel. The Ethiopian trusts Philip. So Philip gets in and he sees what the Ethiopian is reading and then they begin to, well, and then Philip asks about who is this speaking. And so Philip begins to tell him. He starts with this scripture and then he tells him everything that he knows about Jesus. And the Ethiopian is so impressed, is so moved by what Philip says that when they come to some water, he immediately says, look, here is water. So we have to assume that he has, that Philip has explained to him about baptism. They've gotten to that point in the good news of Jesus, which would make sense. I mean, if you started at the beginning, the beginning of Jesus's ministry was his baptism by John. But the 
Ethiopian is so impressed by what he has heard, so moved by Philip's words that he sees water and says, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And here is where our skeptical minds might come in and say, well, so many things are preventing you from being baptized. Philip isn't necessarily, um, well, Philip was told to go out into the world and, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's totally qualified, but Philip doesn't, or the Ethiopian doesn't necessarily know that. Um, you know, who is Philip to baptize him? We might say it's not a proper place. There aren't any witnesses, etc., etc., etc. And Philip's response to what is to prevent me from being baptized is pretty much not a darn thing. There is nothing preventing you from being baptized. Let's do this thing. So they go into the water. And I don't know why. Ever since I was a kid, I always picture a mud puddle. I mean, <laughs> maybe my brain when here's wilderness road pictures a desert and so i don't picture i don't know why there's a mud puddle in a desert either for that matter it would more likely be like an oasis if it was a desert but for some reason my brain pictures them going down the road and there is a mud puddle a pothole something <laughs> and that is what the, the, the eunuch is baptized in and i really don't think that's the case um because they go down into the water so there's enough water for them both to go into and for the Ethiopian to be baptized. But hey, even if it was a mud puddle, gross as that might be, still the spirit would have worked through that moment. Um, am, I, am I a little silly today? I apologize. I just, I don't know. I, this story is um, making me incredibly happy, I guess. It's, yeah. And so he is baptized and then immediately um, he goes on his way and Philip, poof, ends up somewhere else, which happens a lot in stories like this. People are just um, taken and the, and he doesn't need to be there anymore because he has fulfilled his purpose. He came upon this person who was clearly open to hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. He spoke from his heart, told him everything that he knew about Jesus. And then when the man asked if he could be baptized, absolutely, let's do it. He baptized him and then his work was done. The man, like all of us, then has to go about his life um, living out those baptismal promises. And he doesn't do that alone. None of us do. But, you know, the, the pastor or the person who baptized you doesn't then accompany you through your entire life, generally speaking. And so Philip doesn't go with the man. He wasn't assigned to be his personal tutor. He wasn't assigned to be his personal pastor or, or Bible study leader. He was assigned this specific task to go to this place and see what happened. And what happened was that he met a man who was interested in and open to hearing about the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is what we are all called to do. We might not have that angel in our life who gives us specific instructions. Go here at this place at this time and see what happens. But we are called to tell others about our experience with the risen Christ, about our experience with the teachings of Christ, about our experience with our relationship as children of our, our, with our relationship with God as children of God. And we are called to to live out those promises that we have been given. We are called to tell others about our experiences, about the promises that we have been given. And it's not always going to look exactly like this story. It's not always going, you know, you might not encounter someone who is as instantly and openly receptive as the Ethiopian is. But if we, if we are open to those moments, then we can spread God's love. We can share God's love. We can spread the good news of God, of Jesus Christ, with people who are ready to hear it. And notice that Philip doesn't force anything. He asks a question and the Ethiopian responds, and then the Ethiopian asks a question and Philip responds. He doesn't run up to the chariot and say, hey, I'm going to tell you what you're reading. He asks a question, do you understand what you're reading? And he then is invited. And so I think that's a really good picture of evangelism. We don't just shove our way into the chariot. We 
ask a kind of an open-ended question and then we see where it goes from there and it might not always be as easy as this is but you never know where it might lead you ask an open-ended question and then if the person asks one back or seems res receptive you tell them about your experience um, when I was in high school I uh, had a friend more of an acquaintance who was part of a traveling group they traveled around and did um, did ministry and they came to my hometown to do their ministry and he invited me for a walk one night and you know I was 18 maybe young silly oh my gosh this this very handsome young man is inviting me for a walk and I'm thinking oh whatever could it mean well what he wanted to do was tell me his whole um, his whole experience with Jesus and that was fine but he didn't ask if I cared or he didn't ask if I was interested right there wasn't this give and take it was let's go for a walk and then I'm going to talk to you talk at you for an hour and not that he necessarily had to you know make it a romantic occasion because I was all Twitter pated that's not that's not the point the point was that he it didn't matter what I was thinking he wanted to quote-unquote save me even though I um, I, I already considered myself to be saved that having been baptized um, as a Lutheran you know one baptism we believe that we are saved by grace uh, etc and I'm not I'm not getting into a theological debate here over your beliefs in baptism and how that works I'm just saying what my belief was at the time and is and so I wasn't looking to be saved in the way he was looking to save me he was you know wanting to tell me his story and then I don't know maybe have a, an experience like the Ethiopian where I said yes let's let I'd like to be baptized um, so forcing your way into a situation like that isn't the answer but being open to situations is uh, we are going to take a break and um, I think I will move on from this topic but when we come back I'll be looking at the psalm assigned for this week so stay tuned you're listening to the GSMC Bible study podcast and I will be right back Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. the GSMC Bible study podcast where we are talking about the texts assigned for um, the fifth Sunday of Easter uh, this year that happens to be April 29th we have just talked about the assigned text from the reading um, from the book of Acts and I got a little a little carried away talking about being open to the spirit but I, I still stand by that that if we're open we will find ourselves in situations that might be be an incredible opportunity for us to share our faith um, but we need to pay attention to the cues around us so I'm not gonna hammer that a hammer on that again but we're gonna move on to the psalm which is Psalm 22 this week verses 25 through 31 from you comes my praise in the great congregation my vows I will pay before those who fear him the poor shall eat and be satisfied those who seek him shall praise the Lord may your hearts live forever all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations to him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down before him shall bow all who go down to the dust and I shall live for him posterity will serve him 
future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. So, as I said, that is Psalm 20. Two verses 25 through 31. We just get the end of the psalm, which I always find interesting. Um, so I did want to go back and read the beginning of that psalm. I'm just going to maybe read through the whole thing. Um, makes a little more sense. So, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others, and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord, let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled, I can count all of my bones. They stare and gloat over me, they divide my clothes amongst themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, and my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offering of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all of you offering offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me. But I heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust. And I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. So actually, for me, that puts um, the verses that we read, 25 through 31, for this Sunday into a little more context. We read 20, Psalm 22 on Good Friday. That may be where it sounds familiar to you, if it does sound familiar to you, or it may just sound familiar to you as one of the lament psalms. It definitely describes um, reason to lament. I mean, there is so much desperation and desolation in these first verses of Psalm 22. I mean, this is where we get, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The part that gets me every time I read this poem is verse 14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax and it is, it is melted within my breast. I don't know exactly what the psalmist is referring to, but have you ever felt like that? I'm, or, you know, it's, it's obviously it's metaphor. Um, you're not poured out like water, literally your heart isn't literally like wax, but when you just feel like you've been poured out when none of your bones are quite in the right spot, your heart just feels like it's melting or breaking in your chest. This is, I want to say it's, it's a beautiful Psalm of lament. And I, I know that sounds weird, 
maybe eloquent would be a better word. It's just so rich with imagery and you can really feel the the despair that the psalmist is going through. And then in verse 25, we get to this part that we read for this week and um, we get praise and we understand why we should praise the Lord and what the Lord does for us. You know, the, the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Though who, those who seek him shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. So we get this turning as you always, almost always get in Psalms. You get the turning when it goes from lament to praise. And that is one of my, one of the reasons that I really, really love the Psalms, not only because they show every range of human emotions, but they, the laments always have an element of hope and praise in them. And this reminded me of some commentary for this text. Uh, the commentary comes from Eric Mathis, who is the assistant professor of music and worship at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. And he quotes Anne Lamott, who is an author. Maybe you have read some of her work. Um, Anne Lamott, he says, has famously said, hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and watch and work. You don't give up. And after he quotes Anne Lamott, he says, while Psalm 22 cannot be reduced to these words, it does seem as though th this contemporary perspective might be similar to the perspective of the psalmist. And he does talk about um, the psalm as a whole, which is great because um, it's always nice to read things in context. He says it's, um, as I said, a psalm of lament, and it begins in the dark. Um, it begins with that statement that we hear from Christ on the cross, which is why we often read this on Good Friday. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But this psalm was not intended, he says, to be prophetic. Its original form was not Christocentric, even though um, we read it today. We often read it today as being Christocentric because Christ did read it, did quote it on the cross. Um, so there is that connection, but the, the original Psalm wasn't meant to be prophetic, he says. So Psalm 22 is the lament of a conflicted individual. And this is the evident, this is evident in the tension established early in the Psalm. Accusatory statements like, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And I am a worm are juxtaposed with declarative statements such as you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you took me from the womb, you kept me safe. Indeed, he says, the first 21 verses of the psalm display an individual in distress, full of contradictory statements about the human plight and the goodness of God. Mm, that's th how many of you have had this in your life, where you feel such despair, where you look around you and you just think the world is going to hell in a handbasket or, you know, there's no, the, the world just is awful. Or maybe it's your personal life that's awful. And you feel like, you know, you do feel like you're a worm or you feel like your heart is melting like wax or just all of these things. I, I cry to you, God, but you don't answer. And yet you also know that God is there. God's promises endure. It's this, this juxtaposition. It is this, um, well, it's a paradox and I'm a Lutheran. Lutherans love paradoxes. We, we, we talk about being simultaneously saint and sinner. We like things that are held in tension. So maybe that's why this Psalm speaks to me so much, but really this Psalmist, even in his despair, still knows that God is there. Maybe he's having a hard time remembering that or seeing that, but he does know in the core of his being that God's promises endure. And so it's not until the final verses of this psalm, Mathis writes, that the psalmist's timber changes. Though initially, is it timber or timbre? T-I-M-B-R-E. As I said that, I'm not sure. And I apologize. That's why I spelled it. So you would know that I'm not talking about wood. <laughs> the, the tone of the psalmist's um, the tone changes anyway. Though initially conflicted, the psalmist has waited, watched, worked, and persevered. Verse 25 shows that dawn has arrived for the psalmist, who summons the whole community to experience the transformation the psalmist has experienced, and offer thanks and praise 
to God. So this psalm goes from individual to community. Those first 24 verses remain in that first person voice. They are an explicit dialogue with God. But then in verse 25, this psalm changes a bit to become a testimony, sort of answering the disruption present presented in the litany of complaints and questions in the earliest verses of the psalm. So verse 25, which is where we start our reading for today, alters the tone of the litany and sets the individual and even the whole community toward a right and creative relationship. Um, so the individual's experience should correspond to that of the community and should deepen its faith, he writes. From verse 24 onward, the psalmist then establishes the strong implication that what Yahweh has accomplished for the individual, Yahweh will accomplish for the whole world, from individual to community to even the whole world, from the weak, the poor, and those of the lowest status in the community who must seek help from God to the ends of the earth and all nations, those who remember the Lord, turn to the Lord and worship the Lord, they will find a generative faith that will eventually confirm and testify to the past, present, and future deeds of God. So that is the commentary, as I said, from Eric Mathis. And um, he does go on to talk about a few other things, but that's really what I wanted to focus on because I love how he talks about the first part of the psalm and how that leads into the verses that we, that we read today because we don't often have we we don't often have context unless the preacher chooses to preach on psalm on the psalm we don't necessarily know what the context of all of four of the readings that we hear on any given sunday might be so i love that he also included the first 24 verses in his commentary because it seems i think it's really important it shows the depths of despair that the psalmist has been in in order to show how big of a change how much of a turning the psalmist experiences when it goes from despair and lament to praise and thanksgiving when it goes from individual to community and that it makes me curious to know you know if you have had those experiences of despair if you've had those experiences of lament what is your response when you are able to not only internalize God's promises, but um, really, really know that they are there. Because I think we internalize them and we know, we, you know, we maybe our head knows that God's promises are real, but our heart doesn't always feel it. Or maybe it's our heart that knows, but our head tries to be too logical sometimes or tries to um, pick apart arguments or whatever it is we don't always know what we know, right? <laughs> we know it's true, but sometimes we have a really hard time internalizing that truth. And when we can, and we are able to recognize God's promises being fulfilled, then that lament can turn to joy, can turn to praise. And in this psalm, it's not individual praise. The lament is individual, but when it comes to the praise, the praise is in the entire community, as well as God's promises, a reminder that God's promises are for the entire community. So that is a little bit of context on Psalm 22. I am going to um, shut it down for today. Say thank you for joining me. I hope you'll join me again next time. I um, love having you join me for Bible study. Even though I don't get to see you, you don't get to be in the same room with me. I still love all my listeners. I pray for you. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you are hearing God's word and you're able to internalize that. I hope most of all, though, as I say every Every time I end the podcast that you remember and that you know, head and heart, that you are a beautiful and beloved child of God. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.